Good day, everyone, and welcome back to TMAC FPV, your home for your journey to better FPV fun, flights, and racing stuff. Today, we're going to start a small series on building our very own micro FPV race drone, one that meets the specifications for the Multi GP Racing League, yet at the same time is small enough and versatile enough to fly around a small park or even rip it around your yard. Interested? Let's get started. As we mentioned, this micro FPV drone build is going to meet the specifications for the Multi-GP Racing League Micro Class. Specifically, what that means is it's going to be running off of a 2S LiPo as a maximum. It's going to have maximum 2.5 inch props and it's going to have a maximum VTX power of 200 milliwatts. So we've got to meet those specs in this particular build. The methodology by which we're going to determine the components which we will use in this build is going to be similar to that which we used in our best value FPV drone kit video published several weeks ago. In any drone build, one of the first things you want to determine is the type of flying that you'll be doing. In our case, we're building this micro quad with the intent of racing it someday, but we'd also like to do a little bit of freestyle not necessarily with a GoPro, but just doing some acro in our yard or in, in a small park. So really what we want to do is a hybrid of both, but primarily gearing it more towards racing. If we actually got serious about uh, racing and wanted to build a pure racing drone, then some of our components may actually need to change to make the micro quad competitive in that aspect. For each component, we're going to have to identify what are the important parameters because uh, the important parameters for flight controller are obviously going to be different than the important parameters for motors. Then, once we've done that, we're going to research and list the components which meet our desired parameters. Then we're going to compare the product specifications from the manufacturer. These are manufacturer specifications we're talking about. And we're going to take a look and see if there are any product reviews out there from other people that have actually used the uh, products that we're considering. The three frames which we're going to consider are the iFlight iX2 V2, which is up here in the upper left-hand corner, the Airblade Eclair V2, or the FlexRC Ascent X 2.5 inch. The FlexRC Ascent X frame also comes in 2-inch version, 3-inch version, uh, most recently a 5-inch version. I, I think they may even have a 4-inch version. One of the first things we want to look at is cost. iFlight iX2 V2 comes in the cheapest. If we're going to be racing this micro quad, then one of the things that we need to consider primarily is the weight of it. Because one of the things we want to gear this micro quad uh, to is to have the best thrust to weight ratio. That's overall uh, all up weight to include the battery. So if we can reduce the weight of each component, then the overall weight of the entire quad is obviously going to be less in the end. So in this case, the weight of the iFlight iX2 V2 comes in last with uh, 27 grams, whereas the Flex RC Ascent X 2.5 comes in at 14.33 grams. We also want to look at the durability, not really a primary concern, especially if uh, we're racing, but I don't want to have to keep changing out frames. And the durability uh, is going to be dependent upon the thickness of the uh, carbon plates. Here you can see the thickness of all these. Based on my experience from previous micro quad, uh, which I own, uh, you want to have at least a 2.0 millimeter thickness on the carbon plates. Uh, anything less than that, and you're probably going to snap them. If for some reason we do end up breaking parts on the on the frames then we want to make sure that they're readily available to replace them and get them fairly quickly so for my case in north america I, amazon is worldwide you can uh, get the iflight ix2 v2 from amazon uh, the airblade eclair v2 i can get from get fpv in the united states or uh, airblade is out of canada so that's uh, relatively close as well and flex rc ascent frame uh, comes from Canada as well. So all three of these frames are fairly accessible to me should I need to get a replacement for them. One of the things you also want to consider in this uh, build is the stack height space. The space between the top plate or the top of the uh, side plates and the bottom plate. How much room is actually in there uh, because as we'll see later on in this particular build uh, we're going to want to have space for four boards. The iFlight iX2 comes in with enough space for, uh, it looks to me like three boards only. It's only got a 20 millimeter space. 
uh, depicted in this diagram, whereas the Airblade uh, Eclair and the Flex RC Ascent seems to have enough space uh, top to bottom for a four board stack. Taking a look at the reviews on all three of these frames, the, both the Airblade Eclair and the Flex RC Ascent get fantastic reviews. Uh, there's been a uh, few minor problems with the iFlight iX2. If we want to upgrade the motors from the initial ones which we choose to use based on performance, then we want to be able to have the flexibility to do so. So that's what this variable motor mounts uh, parameter is referring to. In this case, the only frame that has that ability is the Flex RC Ascent X 2.5. We also want to take a look at the camera protection. Uh, is there sufficient protection for the camera should we have some sort of head-on collision? In this case, the camera where the camera is mounted in the iFlight iX2, the camera lens actually sticks out from the front of the quadcopter, uh, exposing it to some damage should you have a head-on collision. So that's why I marked no for this particular frame on the iFlight iX2, whereas both the Airblade Eclair and the Flex RC Ascent X have sufficient camera protection, as you can see over here in the diagrams on the left. So, having taken a look at all of those parameters, the frame which we're going to choose to go with on this build is the Flex RC Ascent X 2.5 inch. Taking a look at the flight controllers, the parameters on the left are the ones that were important to me for the flight controller. So with these in mind, the only two flight controllers which I was able to find that met these parameters were the HGLRC XJB F4 and the Airbot Omnibus F4 Nano V6. If there are other flight controllers out there which meet these parameters that you are aware of, please put them in the comments section below so that other people, as well as myself, can become aware of them. For cost, the HDLRC comes in at $5 cheaper. I want to make sure that the flight controller we use is the MPU 6000 Gyro. That's the most stable gyro out there right now. The flight controller has to have a 20 by 20 mount because we're building a micro quad. Betaflight OSD is important to me. The size and weight as we discussed is important. The smaller uh, the size and the less the flight controller weighs is going to be important in the overall weight of the quadcopter. So for our case the HDLRC comes in at 25 by 25 uh, millimeters and it only weighs 8.7 grams with the electronic systems controller or the ESC that is associated with this flight controller. 8.7 grams total for both. Whereas the Airbot Omnibus F4, although it's very capable with all of these parameters, and it can actually go up to 6S, it comes in at 19.4 grams with its associated ESC, which is over twice the weight of the HDLRC. The reviews for both of these are quite good. Uh, the HDLRC, I know, uh, has pins that connect the flight controller with the ESC where you don't actually have to do any soldering. I'm not sure about the Airbot Omnibus F4. That might be the same for that. Uh, some people have reported some problems with the pins uh, breaking in crashes with the HDLRC. I haven't seen any reports on that with the Airbot Om Omnibus F4. However, that's a newer uh, flight control stack than the HDLRC XJB, so more people are going to have flown the HDLRC uh, flight controller with the ESC. To alleviate that situation where the pins break off the uh, HDLRC, we've got a remedy for that uh, in the build. Should we go ahead and choose that flight controller? We want to make sure that the power input uh, takes 2S uh, based on the multi-GP micro, micro class specifications, which both of these do. I am uh, interested in making sure that the flight controller has an external buzzer support because I do want to install an external buzzer for instances where I'm flying this in acro mode and doing a little bit of freestyle or just practicing racing around my backyard and I happen to crash in the woods or tall grass, I want to be able to find this thing by flipping a switch and listening for a buzzer. Because we're building this quadcopter, I think it's important to have some sort of black box capability on the flight controller for tuning purposes because we may come across problems in tuning and having a black box capability, which is just your flight data recorder, will allow us to go into the flight data and take a look at what particular axis we may be having tuning problems with. I also want to make sure that uh, the flight controller we use supports smart audio with a UART. 
available you are that the flight controller has good documentation and have the best documentation possible to support me in this build. I would also like the flight controller to have a smart port uh, which is basically uh, supports uh, telemetry and both of these flight controllers do as long as you remap the resource to accommodate that. Other considerations, the Airbot Omnibus F4 has a lot of filtering, which should mean that you're going to get some clear video with it. Much cleaner power. The HDLRC XJB F4 I know is used in the XJB145 quadcopter, which has got tremendous reviews. So when used in that build, I know that the HDLRC XJB F4 flight controller is working fantastically. Based on those parameters, the flight controller, which we're going to choose for a micro FPV race drone build, is going to be the HDLRC XJB F4. Motors. There's a lot of motors out there uh, that would meet our needs. The lower the voltage, the higher KV motor you want. Since we're going to be running on 2S primarily, we want a relatively high KV motor. But at the same time, because we're building somewhat of a hybrid, we want to be able to run this thing on 3S as well. So three of the motors which we are considering are the Emax 1106 6000 KV motors, the T-Motor Racer Star 1106 6000 KV motors, and the Rotorex 1107 7600 KV motors. The costs are associated with them up here. They're not, they're not too much different in cost. The weight uh, on these two motors, the Emax and the T-Motor Racer Star, are identical. Whereas the Rotor X, because it's an 1107 instead of an 1106, actually comes in a little bit more weight. I pulled these numbers for the parameter specifications either from the manufacturer and or from thrust motor tests, which I found online, using either the same props or as equivalent props as I could find for the motor tests. So having said that, these are the specifications which I came up with doing that. The max thrust for the Emax and the T-Motor is pretty much the same, whereas on the Rotorex 1107-7600, uh, it's much more. However, because it's a 7600 kV, it's much more geared towards 2S than it is 3S, whereas both of these types of motors are easily able to handle both 2S and 3S. The efficiency, which is thrust per power, numbers are down here below. And whenever you're trying to decide which motors you're going to use on your quadcopter build, you need to keep in mind the type of props that you think you'll be using. In our case, we plan on using Gemfan Flash 2540 props. With all of that in mind, the motors which we choose to use on our micro FPV race drone build are going to be the T-Motor Racer Star ah! 6000 KV motors. The ESC which we're going to choose is going to support the motor's peak current plus a little extra for room to spare and it's got to be compatible with the chosen flight controller. Since we chose the HDLRC XJB F4 flight controller, we're going to use the HDLRC 28 amp 4-in-1 ESC which does pin straight to the flight controller with no soldering and it's capable of 2S to 4S power. Based on what we said earlier about some people having issues with the pins snapping off of the boards during quote unintended landings uh, we're going to ensure that the pin pads are epoxied to the board as well as the connectors on the boards. The ESC comes in at a weight of uh, 4.2 grams and combined with the flight controller as we mentioned earlier uh, both of them together come in at 8.7 grams which is very light for both a flight controller and an ESC, to, and an ESC together. The VTX, which we're going to use, needs to support 2S and 4S power inputs. It's got to be smart, audio capable, small and lightweight. I want to make sure it's got an MMCX connectors because I don't like UFL connectors, which tend to pop off uh, at times unless you do this extra soldering or uh, epoxy them to the uh, board. MMCX connectors are just easier to switch out antennas if you happen to break an antenna also. Because of the multi-GP race specifications for the micro class, we need to make sure that the VTX is both 25 and 200 milliwatt capable. Because of these parameters, the VTX which we choose to use in our build is going to be the TBS Unify Pro HV Race MMCX. It has an operating voltage from 2S to 6S. 
Its weight is only 4.4 grams. It does have an MMCX connector, which I'm very excited about. And its output power has both 25 milliwatts and 200 milliwatts. So we are good to go with our VTX. The camera, receiver, and VTX antenna, which we're gonna use, are covered here. The camera is going to be our CADEX Turbo Micro F2. The reason we chose CADEX is because I've had a good experience with the ones I've purchased in the past, and I just like the video that uh, they put out. It's going to have a 2.1 millimeter lens and a 4 to 3 aspect ratio. Now, this is the first time I'm actually going to be using a, a 4 3 aspect ratio instead of a 16 9. The reason I'm doing that is to uh, hopefully have more vertical visual space for racing. The CADEX has a wide input power voltage range, and one of the uh, good things about the CADEX Turbo Micro F2 is that it's got image flip, which means that if you need more space when you mount the camera uh, in order to get the camera angle that you want to uh, because of the connector that's actually on the back of the camera, you can flip the camera upside down, and that way uh, you can increase the camera angle without having it hit the connector on the frame or any of the other electronics in the quadcopter. And one of the nice benefits of this particular camera is it's only $19.99, which is great. The receiver which we use for our micro FPV race drone build is going to be in a uh, free sky receiver because that's the type of uh, transmitter that we have. So we looked at the XM Plus or the RXSR. I've used XM Plus receivers in the past and they're fine. I haven't had any problems with them. However, one of the things that I would like to explore and use is uh, RSSI telemetry, uh, specifically verbal warnings when that's getting low coming from my transmitter. And the only, between these two receivers, the XM Plus and the RXSR, the one that, the only one that gives you that capability is the RXSR. So that's the reason we chose the RXSR uh, is to get the RSSI verbal warning uh, from your transmitter. The VTX antenna, we could have gone linear, but uh, decided to go circular. So with that, we went with the Luminaire Axie uh, right-hand circular polarized antenna. It's got a gain of 1.6 and a near-perfect axial ratio with a weight of 7.6 grams, which is fairly light for a circular antenna. We mentioned earlier that we wanted a four-board stack. The reason why we wanted a four-board stack is because we plan on putting an onboard FPV DVR in this build. Why do we want to do that? because we want to be able to capture flight video without interference from the video transmission of the quadcopter back to the FPV goggles. With an onboard FPV DVR, we're able to do that. I don't want to put a GoPro on this particular quadcopter or any other type of HD camera. I'm not interested in putting a Runcam uh, Micro Split or a Cadex Turtle uh, HD camera on this because I don't want to use those cameras for my FPV feed and induce latency on it. Based on that, that's why we're going to go with an F onboard FPV DVR because with that I can use my camera of choice and it's got less laten latency. The DVR that we're going to choose needs to have a 20 by 20 mount pattern and the Two DVRs which we considered are the HDLRC Nano Stacking 20x20 DVR or the Runcam Mini FPV DVR. You would think because uh, we've went with a HDLRC flight controller and ESC that I would tend towards the HDLRC Nano. Uh, however, if you take a look between these two, the Runcam actually records uh, at a higher rate. It has a better voltage range power supply and it has an SD card guard, which is just this little uh, tiny metal piece which keeps the micro SD card in place during unintended landings. It also auto records on battery connection, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. But because of these things, we went ahead with the Runcam Mini FPV DVR. So those are all the components which we're going to be using for a micro FPV 2.5 inch drone build, which is going to be used primarily for racing and a little bit of acro. Well, that's gonna do it for this video, part one, components. If you've got thoughts on better components to use for this particular build, please put them in the comments section below. We're always open to suggestions. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Remember to subscribe to your channel. In the next video, we're gonna start our build. We'll see you then. Happy flying.